All right. Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for a discussion and presentation on the No-Nonsense Guide to Simple and Complex Extractions. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, I am excited to welcome back Dr. Ben Johnson as our featured speaker. Dr. Johnson is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon and is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. Before I turn it over to Dr. Johnson, just a few reminders. This webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive the link later this week. If you have questions for Dr. Johnson at any point during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A section and we will answer as many as we can live at the end of the presentation. And lastly, there are no CE credits for being no CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending this webinar. Thank you all for your attention, and I would like to turn over to Dr. Johnson. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Henry Schein for having me. Um, I know I was supposed to give this back a couple months ago, but there's lots of wildfires, and I just chalked it up to 2020. It was too much. I said, let's just postpone for uh, a few more weeks, and they gave me this date, and uh, here we are. So I uh, just wanted to go through a couple of things. I hope everyone's been having a good summer, early fall. Uh, this is what I did over the summer in between patients, got a good view of Matt Rainier, did a little bit of hiking, and in between that, some webinars, and then just been busy in my office, basically working five days a week since we reopened up in May. So it was good to get out and do a couple of, couple of different things like this. Um, just wanted to go through a series of pre-COVID me and then during COVID, if you guys tuned into my webinar a few months ago, these are the two pictures you saw. And because I, I don't know if you can see my screen, but I wear my surgical cap all day long and I haven't really needed to get a haircut. So this is me about two weeks ago. Got the nice Afro going on there and I just hide it nicely tucked away into my surgical cap. And it's kind of uh, you know, 2020 in a nutshell, a little vacation working, working hard and letting your hair grow out. So uh, as was mentioned, I went to Utah Valley University for undergrad, Temple University for dental school and did residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. I'm board certified. And basically, as many of you know, tuning in, this is what it feels like when you're done with all that. I don't know if you guys know this, uh, this guy from 30 Rock, but here we are. So now I practice for about six and a half years in Seattle. We have five offices. There's four doctors here, and uh, it's a group practice. We all rotate through the, through the offices, and uh, we have a lot of fun. Here's a couple more pictures of how we enjoyed ourselves this summer. Here's a few photos of my family, Mount St. Helens in the background. I have another slide on that in, the, in, the, in a few minutes. And we spent a lot of time down by the river. Here's one of the rivers that, that runs off of Mount Rainier, the Carbon, Carbon River, and uh, we just spent time there. So we decided to get family pictures there and there's the whole gang. So a uh, big shout out to them as well for their patience. And one more fun fact to keep it entertaining. When I get to the end of a popsicle stick, I basically turn into a beaver. Just a little fun fact, brighten the mood. I don't know if anyone else does that. You can make some comments in there if you do. So um, Henry Shine found me through basically Instagram, the content, and many of you know, I, I helped run a dental conference, Dental Influencers Alliance, and uh, I was approached there and said, hey, do you want to do some lectures for us? And I wholeheartedly agreed. I think it's fun to, to share cases, learn about cases, and a lot of the stuff I post is a little gory, educational, um, and we I like to have fun with it. So again, thank you, Henry Shine, for inviting me. You can go on to Instagram and uh, follow if you want. Um, it's mostly oral surgery stuff and um, uh, I have a lot of fun with it. So the discussion tonight is the role of diagnostic tools and technologies to prep for extractions. What to do when extractions don't go as planned sometimes that happens, and best practices for interdisciplinary communication to support complex cases, which basically means how do you talk to your local oral surgeon or master of extractions um, when you get into a bind or don't want to do a case. Um, it's impossible to teach everything in an entire hour. I'm actually going to set my timer right now. I think last time I went over by almost 
45 minutes and I didn't realize it until 20 minutes after the hour. And most people were like, no, 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 keep going. We're good. We're good. So I'll set my timer here and we're good. Um, so the surest no nonsense way to do an extraction, I'm going to say this relatively tongue in cheek, uh, but it's true is you can refer that tooth. Okay. I'm going to pull this up here. Um, oral surgeons exist for a reason. I have a really easy referral uh, slip to fill out online and uh, it's a no brainer. If you don't want to do it, just refer it. That's the best way to take out that tooth. Have someone else do it. Some hashtags to go along with that. Homie, don't play that. Bye, Felicia. Ain't nobody got time for that. Go in the comment box. I want to hear at the end of this presentation your best hashtag. Kick that to the curb, okay? And uh, we'll uh, we'll shout out the best one, okay? So realistically, though, if you don't want to do it, refer it. Save yourself the headache. We'll get more into that. I'm of the mindset of there is, I have no personal issues with someone who wants to do oral surgery or someone who wants to do endo or someone who wants to do ortho if they're not a specialist. I'm of the mindset of case selection. If, if, if it's out of your comfort level, then have some stop losses of, you know what, I'm going to stop here or I don't even want to start here or I'm going to do some other cases until I'd be comfortable with that. Um, I was reading a book the other day, my son, and I saw this quote. I was like, oh, this is perfect. And this is for every one of us, even myself. We wage war with between the person we are and the person we hope to become. So if you're all about getting better at extractions or implants or endo or ortho or whatever, you're an athlete and you want to get to that next level, you're going to wage war against yourself to get to that level. I just don't want you to wage war on your patient in the process. Okay. That's my only issue. So with that said, that's why I'm, I'm doing this webinar to, to talk about it. So every single time you're doing an extraction, you should have a, a flow chart in your mind of what's, what's going to happen. What am I going to do if, or what am I going to do when, and you start with your hopeless tooth, your wisdom tooth, your orthodontic tooth that needs to be removed for orthodontic reasons. And you end up after this whole thing with your extracted tooth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my personal flow chart and how I go through it. Again, I can't teach everything in an entire hour. Hang that phone up. Um, but hopefully you can pick up some pearls and some, um, some tidbits of information that will help you in your practice. Or you can decide, you know what? I don't even want to do that. And I think I'm going to have to do that for this too. So I'm just going to send it off to the oral surgeon or the periodontist incessant phone calls. Okay. Um, so you're either going to refer the case or you can do the procedure. It's either going to be a simple or complex or anywhere in, in between that range. And there are some things to consider in your practice, the time value of the procedure. Um, I've had uh, several people say, or ask me how much time it takes for me to take out four full bony wisdom teeth on a sedated patient. And that's anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes for all four of them. That's from when I put the gloves on to when I take the gloves off. Um, some, some people tell me, well, I book out two or three hours in my office to do that. And it just kind of depends on your comfort level, you know, a, a general dentist. So you have to look at that. Is that worth the headache? Is that a practice builder? Maybe you're not as busy and you have time and it's of your interest or you're, 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 um, you're trying to get back, get better at it. So it's okay to, to take a couple hours to take out the wisdom teeth, or maybe you're a lot quicker. You can do it in 20, 30 minutes. Um, I've had patients come to me and the, the dentist calls and said, well, this has never happened to me before, but I, you know, I couldn't get the tooth out. And then turns out the patient was in the office for four hours and, they were crying and they couldn't get the tooth out. And, you know, is that a practice builder? So just keep those things in mind. Um, and ultimately humans are not guinea pigs. So we've all seen this little meme. You have different types of headaches and you, you don't want the full on dentistry headache while you're doing stuff like this. Um, if you know Adamo Elvis, he, uh, he's on Instagram. He uh, common or frequently uses, it's not the arrow, it's the archer. So lots of people always ask me, well, what instrument is that? I said, well, it's this instrument, but unless you know how to use it really well, it's not really going to help you. 
but you can get better at it. Um, so this is my armamentarium. Lots of people always ask me, what do you use? This is my basic surgical setup for an extraction. You have the weeder. Um, I'm going to have a list of this too. So if you have your phone, you can just take a picture of it in a minute. Bite blocks, your sweetheart retractor suctions, uh, different uh, Kelly's and Minnesota's, a small runger, different curettes, root tip picks. You can see the cryer elevators or the east-west elevators, periosteal probe, uh, local obviously, suture scissors, um, suture uh, or a needle holder, anesthetic, your Minnesota. It's not the Minnesota I like to use. I have a picture of my favorite one coming up. 15 blade, different sets of elevators, some tissue pickups, larger runger, osteotome. That's what that mallet is used with that osteotome sometimes to, uh, to break the tooth away from the bone. Uh, but these really are the workhorses right here, my periosteal elevator, and then these different elevators. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So here's the list in the, uh, the package there below. Those are some, uh, some luxators, luxatomes, periotomes are different names. Different companies have different names for them. Uh, these ones are from Salvin, uh, but most of my instruments come from Henry Shine through Hugh Freedy or A Titan, and I get a few from Salvin. And my Minnesota comes from H and H. And I'll talk about my my favorite Minnesota coming up. Um, but a pretty much basic surgical setup. This is all stuff you learned about in dental school. Okay, um, my favorite collection of instruments. Here's my Minnesota, the H and H Minnesota. Uh, it's a company out of Coeur d'Alene. I don't know if you can see the number on there. Um, but the, the tip of that Minnesota, the working end is flat. So your flap doesn't come to a point and it doesn't reflect tissue in just one little area. It's actually broad. And so your flap, when you're, um, when you have a flap open, it retains most of that flap open and you can see visualization is the key with something like this. And then my favorite forceps, cow horn, obviously ash forcep and my spade elevator. Really my spade is my go-to. If I can't get the tooth out with a spade, then, uh, then I move on to something else. Um, this is a, a Titan 60 B 60 B it's offset. That's a that little angle on the neck. And it's a combination of a, like a Luxatome, a, the, the width of it is between a small straight and a large straight. Uh, so the point pierces the bone. You can really dig into that PDL space. And then the width of it is a little bit larger than a small straight. So you have a little bit more leverage. And then the offset just helps you get to back molars and, and different areas. You can flip it around and use it uh, in different ways as a crane pick or a Cogswell B elevator as well. And I have some pictures of those coming up. So this is probably my favorite instrument of all time. Um, you have some lower forceps that I really like. These are again are from a Titan. There's a little grip on there. Sometimes those come coated with diamond, but you can see these are for the lower just grips in between those roots. If I don't use the cow horn, this is usually for, for wisdom teeth or third molars, but I'll, I'll use it for other molars as well. This is for the upper molars. Um, I know you have the cow horns for the upper molars. I think those are a bit too aggressive. Um, uh, mostly use this for wisdom teeth, but I'll use it for first and second molars as well. If I find that if I'm using the cow horns or an instrument like this and the tooth isn't bunging or it's taking a while to get that tooth out, then most likely those roots are pretty spread apart and I'm going to have to use my hand piece to section the tooth anyway. So this helps to, to loosen the tooth or remove it. Um, and we'll get into more of, of my, my flow chart here. So the other tool or instrument or device that I have in my office investment is my iCAT Flex. This is a great tool. Uh, I just pulled some of these pictures from the iCAT website. You can get it through Henry Shine as well. All five of my offices have the same one, uh, but it helps you evaluate airway. It can do full face, you know, um, top of the head to the bottom of the neck. So there's a large field of vision, it can do Panorex modes. And there's some other views in here that you'll see. This is the, the machine I use to help me evaluate my uh, procedures or future procedures. Um, what, what the whole point of all that is when you're in an extraction, you don't wanna get trapped. You wanna have different options and different tools to use to get you out of there. And I, I thought this was a 
uh, a cool image to portray that. If you look at, I don't have my pointer on here. I can't get it to, to come up. So you can't see my, my pointer. But if you look at the sun on this image and you look down between the sun and the lake where that little gravel stretches, this is Mount St. Helens, by the way. It blew its top in, uh, in the 80s and kind of flowed into the, the lake you see way off to the very edge of the screen. But there used to be a little um, building there, like a, like a resort slash cabin. Um, the rangers would stay there and it was it was a nice little spot well when the when the volcano blew its top it actually pushed that that lodge into the lake that's on the far uh to me the far right of the screen about 200 yards it's off screen and then 200 yards down beneath the water and the sand and the rubble that's basically where they think that lodge ended up so don't get trapped, okay? So we'll go into the flow chart. Um, it's pretty basic, um, this, this stuff that we're gonna talk about for uh, a simple extraction, but you just wanna have this in your mind. The first thing you're gonna do, obviously, is elevate the tissue, and you know, after the patient's numb or asleep or whatever. Um, when you're elevating the tissue, and I've got some pictures here in the, in the in the moment, you want to make sure that you have a really good elevation. Sometimes that tooth is being held on only by that tissue, and you don't want to rip that tissue, especially when that tooth is close to something like the lingual nerve or the tuberosity. Um, anterior teeth in the palate, not too worried about, but posterior teeth, if you start pulling that, that wisdom tooth or that uh, second molar and that tuberosity, is really adherent to that tissue and you get some tearing, then it's, it's, a, it's a bad day for you and the patient. And typically you have to explain to the patient that there's a tear in the, in the roof of the mouth and you have to suture it. It's kind of an annoying place to suture and get to it. It usually heals pretty well, uh, but there's nerves and blood vessels back there you usually don't want to mess with. So make sure you get really good elevation with the periosteal elevator. Go circumferentially around, whether you elevate the mesial or distal papilla or both or none is totally up to you. I typically like to preserve the papilla, um, but have to blast through them if, if need be, because that's what they make chromic gut for. Um, once that's done, you're going to take your elevator. Again, I go to the spade and you elevate the tooth. Now, you don't always have to do this, and we'll get, that, get to that in a second for like mandibular molars. I sometimes just go straight to the cow horn after that soft tissue is elevated. Uh, but typically you're going to use your elevator and then you're going to grab your favorite forcep or rongeur. I know in dental school, they said, don't use your rongeur. You can use your rongeur as long as you know what you're doing and you can get that tooth out. Okay. So that's pretty, that's how we want all extractions to go. Three instruments, tooth is out, patient's happy, you're happy, no sweat, no big deal. Okay. Well, what happens if that tooth doesn't budge? There's different options you can use. You can uh, use osteotomes or luxotomes or peritomes or your piezo. I think lots of people like to use something called the cube to uh, help elevate. I've never used the cube. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't even know if, if uh, it's through Henry Schein or, or Acteon, I think, but or a handpiece. That's usually what I go to. I personally find that piezos take way too long. So I watch these videos of people using them and by the time they're done, I'm like, I can have the tooth out by now. So they're good for when you want them. No judging from me. I like to use a handpiece, 701 burr, 703 burr. Nothing cuts better than a, a carbide burr at 80,000 RPM under irrigation. Um, after you use the, uh, the, your handpiece or your osteotone, then you can go back to your elevator, you elevate that tooth, and then use your forcep or ronger to, to finish grabbing it out. Now, after you use your handpiece, um, if it's still not moving, sometimes you have to section the tooth. That's with or without bone removal. Again, I am in the mindset of if the patient's not doing an implant now, they might want one later. So I like to preserve as much bone as possible. So if that tooth, I don't know if you guys can see my screen, but if the tooth and the bone are, are, are together and you have the option of removing a little bit of tooth to make your uh, trough around the tooth, then I try to select Let's remove a little bit of tooth. Um, you can remove bone removal. That's a very popular thing to do. I do it all the time as well. And then you can also put a purchase point into 
the uh, tooth and elevate the tooth that way. Either extract the tooth or use your elevator and go then to your forcep. Um, if the tooth doesn't budge, then uh, another way to get access is to flap. You can do envelope, vertical release, posterior release. Um, in, the, in the mucosa, you can keep the papilla, you can spare the papilla. And then some teeth require a vestibular uh, incision to get to, and that's mostly for impacted canines or a supernumerary tooth in the front uh, or an anterior impacted or supernumerary tooth the mandible. Um, and then when you're all done, if you flap, you're going to want to suture. Now, this is like the ideal setup. You know, you're in heaven and you're taking out teeth and nothing can go wrong. Boom. You follow this flow chart, but we live in the real world and things happen. And, and so when oops happen, this is basically what that flow chart turns into because it can get pretty nasty, pretty quick. And a little bit of extra blood, a little bit of extra pain, a little bit of extra infection, or just a really stubborn tooth, or maybe you lose a root tip in the sinus or into a, a mandibular space. And now this flow chart gets a lot more complicated. So that's why, again, go back and say, case selection, what happens if, or what happens when, and what, what am I going to do? So take a moment to de-stress after looking at this. There's a good view that uh, I took from Mount Rainier, backpacking, uh, overnighting with my boys. And this was on top of one of the lookouts. And that was a perfect sunset, little lake down there. And it was like this for two hours. It was 65 degrees. It was a beautiful. Um, so now that we're de-stressed, we can move on to, let's talk about mandibular molars. So. I used to hate taking out mandibular molars and I don't know if it was because the bone was super tough. Uh, maybe I was in residency and I was just tired, but it was a lot of work, especially if that crown broke off and you're like, Oh man, I got to flap this and this bone is super hard and I'm going to be digging for these roots for 30, 40 minutes. Um, now I don't mind taking out mandibular molars. And actually I love it. Um, the best way to do it obviously was that cow horn. So elevate that tooth and you can see there's a little bit of junk left in there from my attempt at Photoshop to get that tooth out. But the cow horn is the best, best instrument in my opinion, as long as the tooth has a nice furcation, the roots are spread out. Um, in fact, we used to have challenges in residency. We would be in the OR, we're taking out every, every single tooth for a patient maybe with cancer, or they had a, a comorbidities that didn't allow us to do it in clinic. And we'd have the cow horn challenge and you get a cow horn and you have to take all the teeth out with it. Obviously we were safe with it, but we got pretty good at taking out all the teeth with just a cow horn. Someone asked me that in other oral surgeons the other day. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, hey, if you can take out any tooth with the cow horn, you can take out any tooth with any instrument. So again, periosteal elevator, you're gonna elevate that soft tissue. And then you can use the elevator or the cow horn forcep first or after. I've got some photos of this coming up and either the tooth is extracted with your elevator or your cow horn or the crown splits in half or the crown comes off. It's kind of the flow chart that you're going to be thinking about with this. If the tooth splits in half, then half of your job is done because now the tooth is sectioned. If the crown comes off, well, the next step is either to section or get the rest of the roots out. Um, then you split the tooth. If it's not, if just the crown comes off, you want to split the tooth with your, with your hand piece and then remove the roots. And we'll talk about retained root tips coming up in a second. That's, that's a nutshell with those mandibular molars. So here's the case I was talking about. You can see tooth number 30. And um, I did not see this patient for consult, but I saw him for the procedure. And this was actually just last Friday. And I said, you know what, sir, this is a great opportunity for me to add this into the lecture. Do you mind if I take some photos? He's like, no, go for it. So here's the x-ray, super long roots. And I was for sure thinking that this tooth was going to break in half. So you look at a tooth like this and you go, well, those roots are really long. I don't know. I've got a couple of crown preps coming up and, you know, maybe, and you're looking at your watch, like, I'm going to refer this out. Sometimes that's a good idea and sometimes it just comes on out. So this particular tooth actually came out 
pretty easily, but I followed the steps. Now you might be asking, why are we taking that tooth out? Patient just did not want to do any endo. He just said, remove it. I want to do an implant. Um, okay, fine by me. When they come to my office, they're pretty much have been educated of all opportunities. We usually ask them, hey, do you want to try to save this tooth? And his reply was, absolutely not. Okay, your mouth, your choice. I'm not going to argue. So there's the tooth. First things first, you got your periosteal elevator. And you can see that image on the left, how much um, elevation of that tissue we're able to gain. You can see the frication. That's a perfect spot to throw one of the horns of your cow horn in. I did the same thing on the lingual. Sometimes tissue is a lot tougher than on one person versus another. Uh, so it just takes a little bit of time to stretch that out. Just be patient while you're doing that. You want to use the sharp end of that instrument. Here's a nice close-up view of that. And that's just a perfect spot to either start with your handpiece to get a bearing on just section that tooth right away or to place your cow horn. In, my, uh, in this particular instance, I went for my spade first because of the long roots. And there's the instrument. It's able, again, to pierce the bone and get right into that PDL space. And you can, you can angle this. So my, my instrument is coming in at like a perpendicular 90 degree angle to the tooth, but you can have that go straight up and down too in a more vertical fashion as opposed to horizontal and then elevate that way. What you don't want to do is put any pressure on the tooth next to the tooth that you're taking out. I learned quickly after one time in residency, if, if you put too much force on the tooth next to the tooth you're taking out, teeth can crack and, and cause issues. So live and learn. Um, elevate from the mesial or the distal and the buckle as well, especially when you're doing this for a third molar. I find the money shot is getting right there on the buckle of the third molar, about this angle with this forcep, and you can get some really good leverage off of the, uh, uh, the buckle plate there. Um, you'll see lots of times on social media, <coughs> excuse me, or, or YouTube or other videos of people taking teeth out and their idea of a throat pack is a finger behind the tooth. Nothing's going to catch anything better than some type of throat screen or throat pack. It's also called lawyer repellent because the last thing you want to do is have an aspirated tooth going down the bronchi of one of your patients and now they've got to go to the hospital and they're spending about $7,000 having someone put a bronchoscope down their throat and pull a tooth out. They swallow it, not a big deal, but they still should go to the hospital and get some series, uh, serial x-rays showing that the tooth is number one in the stomach and number two, that it's actually passing through the GI tract. And if it's a crown, you know, you can tell the patient to uh, fish it out of the toilet. You can turn it in for money. But if you're having that conversation, it's not a good day. So use your throat pack. This patient was wide awake and he was totally fine with this. He just lay it behind the tooth and have it curve up around the tongue. And with gaggers, you can throw your weeder or sweetheart retractor back there and just hold it out of the way. Luckily, I was able to throw a cow horn right on this tooth. And again, I was very patient with it because I didn't want to force it and break it if I didn't have to. But you can see how the cow horn just gets right there into the uh, uh, frication of the tooth. And you guys know the, the pumping and wiggling motion that it takes to get this tooth out. So right when the tooth came out, my assistant said, whoa. And then my patient said, whoa. So it was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty good extraction. But basically, those are the only three instruments I needed out of, off of my tray. I was ready, though. My contingency plan, my flow chart, I was ready if I needed to be. And you can see that that root measured about 31, 32 millimeters. Okay, so what happens if you break the crown off? You can see my image here. Now the crown is broken off and you have just the roots left. Or maybe the patient presents and they just have the roots because of the decay or the crown broke off. So again, the idea is to section the tooth right down the middle. There were supposed to be some images going with this one. I'll just talk about it. So section the tooth, draw a line right down the middle of the tooth. Maybe it's coming up. And let me check and see my power.
Okay, it's coming up. So retained root. Let's talk about maxillary molars first, and then we can get to the retained roots. So one of my favorite things to do when I'm sectioning molars. So let's 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 back up. You've used your periosteal elevator. You've used your spade or your ele your your uh, small straight or whatever you like to use, and then you use your forcep, and this tooth just isn't budging. So the thought process is, well, let's section this tooth. That's we have, how, how we have to take it out. And the middle image, or this first image with the yellow line, that's my favorite cut to make. I don't go all the way through. I just cut through the yellow. I cut through the mesial buckle and the distal buckle root, and I'll stop short. And then I'll stick my spade elevator where that yellow line is, and I give it a little elevation. And the whole idea is to keep the crown on there and take out the palatal root, like in this middle image, as one piece. Doesn't always happen, but when it does, you feel like the bomb, and you can just take out the mesial buckle and the distal buckle root. Pretty easy to do that once you're at this point. And uh, um, maybe some stitches when you're done and, and call it a day. So try this when you are stuck with a molar like this, just section halfway through the tooth. Don't cut the whole crown off, section halfway, and then just gently elevate the tooth. Once you have a little bit of movement on there, all it takes is grabbing that crown, again, with my, my third molar forcep is what I like to use for the upper. Give it a little twist like you're doing an anterior tooth, twist, wiggle, twist, wiggle, little figure of eight. And a lot of times you'll get the palatal root out with the crown, and then all you have to do is focus on the mesobuckle and the distal buckle root. So here's a, a case where we did that. Really nothing to grab onto. I, I couldn't do the palatal technique here, but I was able to remove this part of the, uh, the crown that's still there, and then section, make a little Y cut. You know, the two split the mesial buckle, the distal buckle, and the palatal root from each other. You want to be aware of your handpiece, and when you're going deep, especially at an angle, working on maybe the opposite side of the mouth, that your handpiece isn't cutting into the adjacent teeth. And you also all wanna be aware of where the sinus is. You also wanna go deep enough so you're actually splitting the tooth and you're not just you know, cutting one enamel layer away at a time, one enamel or dentin cell layer at a time. Um, so go deep enough, check frequently, make sure your angulation is correct. And if everything goes right, you throw your elevator down there, you can split those roots up and you can get them out. Um, sometimes the tooth is so brittle that it's just gonna break all the way down to the apex. And you can't really do anything about that, but there's some things that you can do to help you get that tooth out. So there it is section, there it is removed. Um, eventually, our, uh, I did an implant for this same day, um, another discussion. So that's the goal to get that tooth out. Again, typically, a tooth with really widespread out roots like this, you're gonna potentially do some damage to that buckle plate. And if the patient ever wants to come back or they're, they're planning on getting an implant, you want to make sure that you're preserving as much bone as possible. So uh, if that comes out great uh, like this, but just be aware that when you're putting a lot of force on that upper forcep, that you're not destroying bone in the process. And if you are, just stop, take an extra five, 10 minutes, Use your handpiece, section that tooth, and get it out. So retained roots. I didn't have any good images of this because I guess I do it so often that I, I get bored if I have to take pictures of it. So I, I did some drawings. Bear with me. Uh, the red is the gum tissue. The yellow is the bone. But let's say you've elevated that tissue. It's all out of the way. And this this tooth root is below the level or right at the level of the crest. Now these can be difficult because a lot of times you'll have decay that goes down like almost a saucer shaped. The best way to do, to take out a tooth out like this, especially if it's a thin, um, thin amount of bone holding that tooth in is a rongeur. Now I showed this trick, I was shown this trick by my, my chief resident and then the, every GPR that came through our program who rotated for a month, I would say, do this, because they come get me. And, and we had a super busy clinic. And I was like, don't bother me anymore with this. I'll show you how to do it. And then, then you can just do it. But you take your rongeur, even if you're doing an implant, and you can grab that coronal one or two millimeters of bone and just pinch, pinch and twist. Usually that bone will free itself up you can take that out. That's not really going to do anything for your 
for you and your implant anyway. You're going to be doing some grafting. And then you have got some good, solid tooth structure to grab onto that's not decayed. Now, if it becomes mushy and decayed, well, then you have an issue and you have to do some other things to get that out. But most of the time, you're going to be able to grab the coronal aspect of that root with the ronger and twist it out. Um, and we'll go back to what to do if, if that doesn't work. Uh, Multi-root, here's that drawing I was looking for earlier. You're gonna split the tooth and then you're gonna remove this bone in between the two roots. That's gonna create some dead space. Teeth are gonna wanna move into dead space. And that's why you trough around a wisdom tooth and you go back distal buckly behind it and a little bit mesial buckly and then you section that too. So now you've got room all the way around this whole tooth that you can elevate into. So the whole idea is to be able to elevate the mesial and the distal root into this empty space. So the tooth is sectioned, that's the red line. The bone is removed in between. And you wanna make sure that you're removing enough bone there. Uh, that's the blue lines. And then you take your luxator, your spade, whatever your piezo, whatever floats your boat and you ram it in there and elevate that tooth into that empty space. Now, again, I don't know if you can see my screen, but sometimes you're elevating that mesial or distal root and the mesial or distal portion of that root is hitting up against the other root. Well, all you have to do is remove a little bit more of that tooth structure to keep it moving into that dead space. There's frequent times where I take out a wisdom tooth and I elevate it and all that tooth is moving, but this, the, the hole in my access hole I made is too small to deliver the whole tooth. So I just have to cut the tooth away in small portions, maybe take it out in three pieces. Um, and you remove your interference. Tooth structure is best because you're taking out the tooth instead of bone. Take out the tooth, toothy interference and then keep elevating that tooth into that dead space that you made. So that elevator is gonna elevate let's just say mesial in this particular case and get that tooth out. Uh, another trick, if you're doing an immediate implant and that tooth root is being really stubborn, I will actually do my osteotomy. The osteotomy performs this part right here, the blue line removal. So that's where your, your uh, implant drills are going and it removes all of that. We have to wait for this spade to do its thing again. You're removing all that bone with your osteotomy and now, after you're done with your final drill, you can take that spade or your, your luxatome or whatever and elevate that tooth root into that space. Uh, another trick that is good with this is that root actually helps guide your implant drill because it's a little bit easier to drill through bone than it is through uh, a tooth. You just wanna make sure that you're taking x-rays before and after just to make sure that you've got the whole tooth before you do your implant. So a lot of you, if you do follow me on Instagram or have seen other photos, there's these little holes in teeth and um, lots of dental students are saying, what, the, what are those holes? And as a dentist, you probably know they're called purchase points. So tooth isn't really budging. You can't get an elevator in there. Well, just drill a hole in it. Visualize a point of leverage where if you put a hole in there and then put an instrument in there and elevate it, would that lift that tooth out of there? Um, and typically I, I will do this on mandibular molars or premolars, not so much on anteriors, just there's not much bone there to help with your elevation, but molars are great because you have the, um, the buckle bone to elevate off of, and that's pretty strong bone. So my two favorite, uh, instruments for purchase points are the crane pick, which is the, is the one with the edges on it and then the Cogswell B, and it's, you have these holes here, they're typically called B point or B hole. Infer what you want from those. And once you put your hole in there, you just stick this instrument in there and you elevate. I think I have a cool image right there. So there's different areas where you can put your, your purchase point or your B hole in the tooth. Um, you can put it on the crown. Let's say this, this molar right here that has the two black dots on it is sectioned through the crown and you have the mesial half and the distal half, well, put a little purchase point right there and stick your elevator in there and elevate. See the, the force of the action right there. If you just have one root left, this is also what criers do, 
or your east west um, they just tend to remove a little bit more more bone uh, when they work but place your place your hole in there with your hand piece make sure it's big enough for your instrument to enter and elevate away that tooth comes out you saw my um, my instrument tray that I had a mallet and some, some osteotomes or luxators is what Salvin calls them, your luxator. Well, these are different series, different sizes. There's a spade, there's some angled ones, there's some straight ones, there's large and there's small. But if a tooth is being a pain, like let's say this tooth is being a pain, you've tried your luxator, it's not working, you can actually drive that instrument all around the tooth and you don't want to tap too hard. You also want to warn the patient, little tip. Tell the patient, you know, I've done everything I can. I have to use a little bit of tapping to get this tooth out. And give them a couple of warning taps, just a tap, tap. I usually have my assistant use the mallet. I'll hold the instrument so I have better control on the retractor. And they'll give a couple of taps gently at first and say, okay, patient, how was that? And some are like, oh, man, that was crazy. And then, okay, well, sorry. And then you do it again a few more times. Lots of time in my office, at least, patients are asleep. But when they're awake, you just warn them, talk them through it, and just tell them that your tooth is so fused to the bone that I have to actually do some tapping to free it up. It's, it's, uh, it's fused, and the only way to get it out is to unfuse it. So you want to go from the mesial, the buccal, uh, the distal, the lingual, the palatal, whatever. Go all the way around the tooth with your elevator and usually you can get some movement if it's not moving then you might have to remove some bone or cut the tooth <coughs> to uh to free it up remember you want to create some empty space for that tooth to go into or just cut the tooth in half and by removing portion of that tooth structure the rest of the tooth can move into the space where the other part of the tooth used to be into that dead space kind of get it right so this was a pretty boring slide until I added the picture of the mountain in the background. Uh, but here's an example of your retained root. You can either cut it all the way down or you can remove a portion of it. That portion flies out with that arrow and then the rest of that can be removed or elevated into that dead space. Or you can grab it with your rongeur uh, and remove just a little bit of that bone and grab the rest of that. Um, an unconventional way of removing teeth, sometimes I'll have this really small root tip way down, buried at the bottom. And instead of trying to dig for it, I'll just take my hand piece and I'll go down and I'll just obliterate it. So I've done that a few different times. When that root tip is up there, I can't quite get to it with my instruments, but my, my surgical hand piece at a good angle so I'm not damaging any other structures. I just go in there and quick zip zip and either that root tip spins free and get the rest of it or the handpiece just turns it into tooth dust and I irrigate and call it a day. So as long as you have that, that flow chart, that, that, uh, that path to follow in your mind of what's going to happen if, or what's going to happen when, then you shouldn't really get into too much of a bind. And if you do, and it's been 30, 40 minutes, then just, call your local oral surgeon. Hopefully you have a good relationship with them and say, hey, can you bail me out? Just don't do it at 4.30 p.m. or 5 because I want to go home too. So um, almost coming down to 15 minutes left, so we're making good time. Um, complex extractions in the specialist relationship. So... In residency, we're trained to be this guy on the couch. Everything's on fire around you, but you're just, you're just hanging out. It's going to be okay. Okay. Um, on anesthesia or trauma, we saw all sorts of stuff. And so when a tooth comes in through our door and it's complex, not a big deal. We just have to talk about the risks, the benefits. We have to get the tooth out. <clears throat> So while you're communicating with your specialist, um, just, I guess if you're going to venture into the, the oral surgery world and not oral and maxillofacial surgery specialty, but just doing oral surgery in general, um, just talk to them, say, Hey, I like to do this stuff. If I'm ever in a bind, can I give you a call? 
hopefully your oral surgeon is like me and says, sure, not a problem. Let me know if you ever need any help because it's going to be okay. Here's a case. Um, one of my partners saw a little bit ago and, and texted everyone and said, hey, here's a good case for you. I was like, oh, throw it up on my schedule. I'll do it. It's tooth number 32. Obviously a little bit of pathology going on. Patient was in pain and you can just see that it looks like a hairy, hairy tooth to get into. Um, tooth went or the nerve went right next to the tooth. It was on the lingual aspect. That's always a bonus in my opinion because we're accessing mostly every tooth from the buckle. That's where it helps to have your 3D imaging. Um, but once we were able to, I know it looks like a super tough procedure, but gosh, I was in and out of this mouth in like 20 minutes. Once you, once we accessed the area and got the crown off, those roots pretty much followed. And I was thanking my lucky stars that that's what happened. Uh, the patient came back a few different times, you know, just kind of complained. So there's some tenderness and some issues and that back molar you're monitoring as well. Most of the bone grew back patient to, to this day. This is gosh, eight months ago, um, has continued to uh, save that tooth, number 31, and everything's good. What's interesting is she came back a month after this other tooth and said, well, number 17 is bothering me. And I looked her dead in the eye and said, no, it's not. And I, that tooth is still in her mouth today because I don't know if I want to touch that one. Typically, a tooth that has some pathology around the crown uh, is a little bit easier to come out because a lot of that that dead space has already been created for you where you can elevate that tooth into. The other tooth, uh, it just looks a little hairier. I could do it if we wanted, but right now it's not really hurting her. I think she just wanted it out of there for peace of mind, but I didn't want to take it out for my peace of mind. Um, so again, it's going to be okay. So I have a couple more cases uh, to present like this. As I'm going through these wisdom tooth cases, just think that the principles I've already talked about pretty much apply to wisdom teeth as well. You want to have good visualization access. You want to know where the tooth is going. So you're not drilling inadvertently into other structures like nerves and other teeth and blood vessels that you don't want to. Um, a lot of, a lot of people in, and this is not to be sexist or anything. A lot of people throughout the years have said, well, if you're, if you're not doing oral surgery in your office, then, you know, you're, you're not taking advantage of income that you could be taking on, or you should buy this practice because that person sends out all of the endo and ortho and oral surgery. And why don't you just do it all? Well, you might not necessarily want to do that in your practice. Um, so just don't drink the Kool-Aid, just do what you want to do and you'll be fine. So here's another case. This, these all presented to me within this last week. I had some other ones from before. I switched them all up because um, I thought these were better representations. But this is pretty much what I see every week. Sometimes I'll get some good, uh, good teeth that are easy peasy. I didn't have any crazy ones today. But these all came in last week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I threw them in the presentation. So the upper molars look pretty straightforward. I'm not too concerned about them. Again, to get those out, you're going to have a vertical release distal to that tooth on the tuberosity. And you're going to bring it forward. You're going to do your flap and, and wedge your instrument into there. You've seen plenty of cases like this on my Instagram and other people's Instagrams. Bloody Tooth Guy is a great example um, of taking out teeth like that. But again, you want to make sure that when you're going to tackle a case like this that you're not getting in over your head. If you don't have 3D imaging, it's probably best to send it to someone who does and let them take care of it. There's some indicators you can look at on the radiograph, the RUDES indicators, R-O-O-D. And if you look at tooth number 32, you can see those really don't follow any of those indicators. You can see the canal, the tooth doesn't really change any color. Um, as opposed to the other side, the tooth changes color, the canal changes direction a little bit. So which one is going to be more intimately involved? Probably tooth number 17. So I got a cone beam CT scan to look at that tooth. I wasn't very worried about tooth number 32 
and altered sensation to the to the uh, IAN, but I was more on 17. So this is where that ICAT comes in handy. You can see that you can you can rotate this head in many different directions. Um, this is actually the my my ICAT took the DICOM images. The software I use to view this is Anatomage or in vivo. Um, but you can rotate this 3D image in any direction you want, oblique, up, down, sideways, and you can get the perfect viewpoint of, of what you want to see. So once you have that 3D image up in the, in the right plane, you can click on a portion of that image and scroll through like you would a normal CT scan. So you can see exactly how close that nerve comes to this tooth. This is on the buccal aspect. You can see this image uh, showing us the, uh, the, the sagittal view and then the coronal view, kind of an oblique with a head up coronal view. And you can see where that nerve is on the buccal aspect of that tooth. So it just shows me where I can approach that tooth with my handpiece and which direction I want to put some of that leverage. And this tooth was, like if I scrolled a little bit more in, you can see that supposed to be mesial root has a nice curve and a hook to it. And you wouldn't notice that looking at this x-ray right here. See how that looks totally fine. But right here, that's where that hook is. So that's the advantage of 3D x-ray. You can see where that nerve is. You can see where any anomalies are on the root anatomy. And you can plan your case. I was going to plan this case. And then I was able to zoom in on the root tip of that uh, curved root. And I found this right there. Giving me the big KO. So we got that tooth out. No big deal. Uh, patient was not numb. Here's another tooth. You can see the direction. Um, uh, this is actually number 17. This, this nerve was on the lingual aspect. Uh, no weird anomaly with the wisdom tooth. It's just that you want to be careful when you're elevating this tooth from the buckle again. That's that, mid, that middle arrow and the large middle arrow. When you're elevating that out, you're going to be probably elevating it out towards the uh, other arrow, the large arrow. And you just want to be careful that you're not putting too much pressure on that nerve when that tooth is coming out. Even though your instruments don't go that deep, you can still crush a nerve fairly easily by putting too much force on a tooth. So this is a perfect example of, well, let's trough around the, the tooth, maybe give it a little wiggle, see how mobile it is, probably cut the crown off, remove the crown, put a purchase point from the buckle into that tooth where that middle large arrow is, and then use your cry or crane prick. So you're just lifting it straight out as opposed to putting a force on it that's going to rotate and crush that nerve that's being pointed to by that smaller arrow. It's gonna be okay. Uh, another case, again, upper wisdom teeth, not too bad. Mm, I'll talk to the patient a little bit about possible sinus exposure and what we would do if that happens, but I, I'm not too worried about this. There's a lot of space between the floor of the sinus and where the gums actually are. Most of the time they'll fill in with a blood clot, not cause any issues. What I am again worried about is tooth number 17. Not so much 32. You can see that all the time in my practice, but you'd be surprised. Let's get a 3D x-ray, see what it looks like. So here is number 32. You can see I wasn't too worried about it. It's a it's a 3D object, the 3D patient, smooshed on a 2D image. So there might be some space between that nerve and the tooth. And you can see that there definitely was. Here's a blown up view of the view on the left. And the yellow is the nerve. The green are the root tips, pretty much at the apex of the tooth or where it got closest to the nerve. And you can see, to me, that's an entire football fields worth of bone to protect me from getting anywhere near that nerve. I can tell the patient with pretty good confidence that there's not going to be any issues 99.9% .9 of the time with the feeling on that side of, of the mouth. Now this one's a little bit different because you can see the red, we were able to, to uh, draw out the nerve and the red line denotes a little curve in the, the root morphology or the, the nerve the nerve path around the root morphology 
You can see that also on the, the scrolled through portion of that 3D image. So again, a tooth like this, I will probably trough around it. I'll probably section it into distal and mesial edges. I'll remove a little bit of bone distal to the crown. So then when I break that tooth in half, that distal part of uh, the crown and the root can be elevated posteriorly into that dead space. And once that's removed, that mesial portion is pretty easily elevated into the distal dead space where the distal crown and root used to be. And then you're not putting really any pressure on that nerve. So uh, I posted this on my Instagram last week. Again, this all came in uh, last week and I asked the question, how many wisdom teeth are here? Well, if you said four, then game over for you. You know, remember Tom Brady, not a big fan of Tom Brady, by the way, I'm a Seahawks fan and, and uh, yeah, deflate gate is still, still near and dear to my heart. Just kidding. I'm over it. Um, so again, something to look at. If you look at this, this panel, you can say, well, those lower teeth, I don't really see that much um, proximity to the, the uh, inferior alveolar nerve. But what I do see is maybe some issues with those upper teeth and the sinus. So I'm going to get a 3D x-ray. Plus that 3D x-ray is also going to tell me how many teeth there really are. Because again, it's a 3D object smushed on a 2D image. And there might be another couple of teeth uh, buckle or lingual that are being hidden by the, the 2D imagery. Who was laughing at this? <laughs> How are, what are the Buccaneers? Are they, they have a pretty good record this year? I don't even know. Okay. So the upper, it was a number one. It was actually, you have the normal wisdom tooth. And right below it, there were three little denticles or kind of undeveloped teeth. So I just charged a patient for two teeth there. Um, but you can see it's going to have a conversation with the patient say, hey, there's, uh, there might be some issues with the sinus when we get this tooth out. Again, there's a lot of space from where that sinus floor is down to where the gum tissue is. So if there is an issue, what I'll most likely do is put some gel foam up there or a, a collar plug and suture it and just have you not blow your nose for a couple of weeks. Typical sinus precautions. What you don't want to do is lose both or all three of those teeth into the sinus. Uh, cause then you probably will be wanting to call me. You might not even want to do this to begin with, uh, down there, very low risk to the nerve. And this, the other side was very similar to this one. Again, the 3d imaging, you can rotate this, you can remove the mandible and you can see <clears throat> where that extra tooth is right here. I don't know if that extra tooth is palatal, if it's buccal, and right here gives me a pretty good idea that that one is actually a little bit palatal. So when I have my flap open, I'm not digging towards the buckle. I can actually aim my instruments and my, my focus or toward, uh, sorry, I got confused. Number one, there's actually two teeth. There are three teeth there, some on the buckle and some on the palatal, but you get the idea. You can focus your attention towards where that tooth is. And uh, another case, I did not have the 3D uh, imaging of this. Um, I do, I just, I couldn't, couldn't pull it up in time for today. But again, patient is having no symptoms anywhere else except for, of course, the worst looking tooth number 32. I told the patient, I am not worried about one, 16 or 17. I do all those, I do those every day, day and night. But number 32 looks crazy and said, which one are you having pain on? Of course, number 32. So it's just how, how you approach the tooth. Are you going to go from the buckle or the lingual? Are you going to section that tooth? Once it's sectioned, where are you going to put purchase points or how are you going to take those tooth roots out? And that 3D imaging can help a lot with that. Um, and then again, I, I personally don't care what you do just when something goes wrong. Cause I've had, 
I've had dental colleagues call me up and say, hey, this happened and now this is happening because of it. When something goes wrong, you're gonna be compared to that specialist in the field of expertise. Um, I will never throw anyone under the bus. Hopefully um, you will not do the same. It's, I think it's all about being ethical. In fact, one of, one of our, our board, my board, my oral board questions, there was, they'd give a scenario and at the end they spent five minutes just talking about some ethics of a case. And one of my scenarios was, uh, it was an OKC. So I had to talk about all that, you know, pathology and legion, how do you treat and what happens if this and that, and then, you know, running down the rabbit hole of different scenarios. But at the end, they said, the mom comes back to you after this, this large lesion is treated and said, you know, we got our old x-rays from the orthodontist and it looks like four years ago, the OKC was there. And he never said anything about it until six months ago when he referred you to me. And what would you say to that parent? Say, well, you don't want to throw anyone under the bus. Okay, so the idea is to have a good relationship with your colleagues, with your oral surgeon. If all you ever do is dump on your guy or your endodontist, then that guy might be a little bit more inclined to say you're a moron. Um, so have a good relationship. You're gonna be compared to that specialist in your field, whatever it is you're doing. I did a quick search on the internet and I was just thinking about expert witnesses, any industry, and I found this guy. He is on an expert witness website. He's a construction, construction engineering management expert witness based out of Indiana. And what people can do is if they need an expert witness, they can go to this website, they can hire this guy in Indiana, and he'd be more than willing to come out and throw anyone under the bus as long as you pay him enough money. So he's got 25 years of experience, his BS in India, his MS at the University of Cincinnati, PhD in civil engineering. He teaches, he's written several thousand articles and he's just this guru in civil engineering. And if you build his bridge wrong or your bridge wrong, he's gonna be the guy that testifies against you. There are guys like this or gals in our industry as well, dentists, oral pathologists, whoever wanna make a quick buck or maybe they are looking out for the safety of patients but they will easily sit on the stand and tell you what you did was wrong, even though you might've been doing things within the scope of uh, your practice and they're gonna pick you apart. So it's just very important to have case selection. Even if you do everything correct and maybe the lingual nerve is numb or you lost a tooth root in the sinus or the some men, some mandibular space or something, uh, they're gonna just question your training, your, you know, what happened, your time frame, how long did it take you to send uh, the referral, blah, blah, blah. You get the point. So case selection, measure twice, cut five times, curse profusely, punch a wall, give up and call a professional. Okay, hopefully that's not the case. And hopefully this lecture will kind of help talk about this. So real quick case to end it. Uh, here's a case um, I did again last week. Impact full, full bony third molar, there is the incision site. Now some, some of you beginning or wanting to get into this a little bit more might want to elevate that mesial papilla. Uh, this is um, number 32 that I'm taking out. So the papilla, mesial to 31, sometimes people will elevate that just to get a better view. I tend not to, I like to preserve that even if it's a, a deep horizontal tooth. I think I'm good enough to get down there and quick enough where that incision site is going to be nice and small and typically the patient will heal quicker. There's lots of oral surgeons that open that up. No big deal. Throw a stitch in. Chromic does its thing. It's the way I like to do it. So there's the elevation. You can see my Minnesota elevator right there. The one from H&H &H, has a nice flat ended working end. So you're not down to a point where it's not rounded and your flap is like folding in on yourself and you're getting frustrated because you have to keep repositioning that stupid thing. Put one that's gonna be flat against the bone. It's gonna elevate the cheek adequately and that flap adequately. And then you got lots of working space. Like, I mean, that's like a runway. You could land a whole 703 bird right in there. And that's exactly what I did. So I started sectioning and I said, no way, let me take a picture. This is a good, this is a good image of that tooth. Now, um, I did have a 3D x-ray on this one and it was showing the nerve was on the lingual. So I knew 
with pretty good confidence that I could go down the buckle pretty much as far as I wanted to avoid number one, I'm going to be avoiding that lingual nerve because it's on the complete opposite side of the tooth. And by doing that, it also gives me pretty good directionality of where that tooth is going. Sometimes a tooth you can tell in the panel or more definitively on the 3d x-ray will be the crown will be inclined towards the lingual or the buckle. It'll be flipped upside down sideways, this and that. So expose enough of that crown where you can see the direction of that tooth. You can see the occlusal surface. And this is pretty basic for a mesial angular full bony impaction. And once you see that little notch between the distal and the mesial buccal cusps, that's where you make your, your cut. So 703 going in, it's sectioned. And again, see the distal line angle, the distal aspect of that tooth. There's a nice trough there that's now dead space. That's a, that's a space where that tooth can be elevated into. And then once that's removed, the mesial uh, portion of that tooth comes out pretty easily. And I don't know if you can see that way down there. It's got the three little shiny lights on it right in the middle of that extraction site. That is the, the nerve running um, from distal to mesial right through there. Patient was fine. There's no profuse bleeding. Nerve is intact. I don't see any damage to the nerve sheath. And there was very little pressure put on that nerve because of the plan of attack, which I could find, or which I could plan based off of the CT scan. Um, I don't really do anything different. Um, if there was no nerve, I just irrigate the site, put a, put a stitch in and let the patient know that saw the nerve and we'll follow along if needs be and, and kind of uh, map out if there's any numbness and how that's improving over time. And that is extractions in a nutshell. It's as much as I could throw in in an hour. Obviously, people will go to lots of school to learn how to take out teeth and you get better over time. But I would love if you wanted to reach out to me on Instagram, feel free to follow if you don't already. And uh, we can learn and collaborate and uh, get some more, more cases going between the between me and the rest of you all out there. So thank you. Thank you again to Henry Shine. That'll do it. Great. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, we're a little over on time, but I had quite a lot of questions. So I wanted to just ask the most frequently asked questions. Um, the first one is surrounding cow horns. A lot of people didn't know there were more than one type and they just thought it was mandibular. Are you able to expand upon that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so the maxillary cow horn is basically the one with three prongs on it. I never learned the numbers. Don't ever tell any of my oral surgery colleagues. I don't even know what number that is. But it's the one of the three prongs. You have the, excuse me, the really long prongs on them. You can have one that has one long one and then a short one for the palatal. Um, that's basically a maxillary cow horn. All right. Could you please explain a little more about the maxillary molar partial sectioning technique? Um, I'm thinking that that was back with the palatal, let's see, sectioning, getting close to it. Maybe I passed it. I was really trying over the past couple of weeks to find a case that I could do that with. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you're talking about the, the sectioning. If you come from the buckle, if you can see my screen, come from the buckle and you're just sectioning the mesial buckle and the distal buckle root from the crown. So you're leaving the crown attached to the palatal root. So you have the crown, the palatal root, and you've sectioned the two mesial buccal and distal buccal roots. And then you just elevate, you put your elevator right into that, um, that plane where you sectioned from mesial to distal, and you wiggle it a little bit. You might hear a crack, and hopefully that's just the, the two uh, buccal roots breaking free. And then you elevate the crown and a lot of times if you wiggle that enough, 
you're going to take the crown and the palatal root out at the same time. And then that just remain, that just leaves the mesial buccal root and the distal buccal root to remove. And those are usually pretty easy once the palatal root or is removed, or you can section those and take those out. Hopefully that answers that question. Let's see if I can find that slide again. While you're looking for that, in your opinion, what is the best way to treat a dry socket? We never get dry socket. They're just kidding. Um, you've, you've heard people say that. Um, I take gel foam and I just put some eugenol on it. There's eugenol droppers. We also have some eugenol cream. The favorite thing I have ever used though was called Alvogil. I think Septonet used to sell it uh, through Henry Shine and they stopped, they stopped selling it um, a while ago. It, was, it looked like chewing tobacco and you could open up the jar pull a little bit of this fibrous material out and it was just coated um, little fibers with eugenol and you just stuff it back down into that site. So now I just use gel foam. I put a couple of drops of eugenol on it. I let the patient smell it and say, this smells really bad. It tastes horrible. So I'm going to just gently plop it back there and have you bite on some gauze so you're not tasting this. And um, typically that will do the trick. Very simple, very easy to do. We don't see that many dry sockets here. I might pull out the eugenol once every three months for something like that. Uh, so pretty infrequent, but uh, that will do the trick. And luckily most dry sockets, well, most dry sockets are best treated by not being in the surgical site for more than 10 or 15 minutes. The longer you're in a surgical site, the more likely someone's gonna get a dry socket. Um, so that's number one, go quick, but quality. And then if they get a dry socket, that's what I do. Pretty, pretty, pretty basic. Here's the, the slide, I think. I don't know if you can see. The yellow is where you section those roots off. You're going from mesial to distal, and you're just cutting those two roots. You're leaving the palatal root attached to the crown. The squiggly line is where you want that tooth to break. So then after you make the yellow cut, you put your elevator in there and you give it a little twist. And then the middle image is showing the paddle root still attached to the crown. And if you put your forcep on there, a lot of times you can wiggle that crown out with the paddle root. And then you just have the two paddle roots remaining. The third image is just showing you bypassing those first two images and just cutting the crown off and taking out the tooth like you see in the two actual photos of making the Y cut in the tooth. How would you tackle fused lower molar roots or let's say upper second molars broken at bone level as splitting is difficult and no grip with forceps? Um, I would love to know splitting is difficult means. If you have a 703 burr or a surgical handpiece of some type, um, it's pretty easy to split those roots with rotary. Um, once those are split, uh, again, you just have to, sometimes teeth are annoying. I, I tackled a tooth again last week where it just broke and broke and broke all the way to the apex. And no matter what I did, it was broken. Tap it, tap it, using my osteotomes, using the handpiece. It was just a, a pain in the butt. But on most molars, uh, you can use rotary to section each root individually, split it, and then and then use your osteotomes, especially if it's fused, use your osteotomes. Those are actually really good instruments just to get in there or your peritomes and you're kind of tapping away or you're driving that uh, into that tooth. Some teeth are just gonna be fused and it's gonna be uh, a little bit bigger pain in the butt. So stick with it. When is it okay to leave a root tip? Mm -hmm. Never leave a tooth behind is what I was trained to do. I, I don't even like to do coronectomies because, again, last week I had a patient come back, coronectomy done six years ago by another practitioner, and I ended up having to take the whole tooth out and, you know, the whole nerve issue and stuff. Um, the only time I like to use a root tip is if it's a small P. Well, number one, the tooth is not infected. Number two, the root tip is small enough where it's not going to be an issue. And if it's next to... Uh, a sinus or a nerve. If you can take an x-ray and it's like one or two millimeters and it's close to a vital structure, and I mean like, not like close to it, but like next to it, 
touching physical contact and you're thinking I'm going to cause more damage than good by getting this out, then leave it behind. I rarely have to do that though, based on how I take out teeth, not getting that many retained root tips. But I have just recently, I had a patient come back. Tooth number 12 was taken out. It was one of those tough teeth. No matter what I did, couldn't do it. I thought I took my burr and went all the way down to the apex and annihilated it. I took a PA. It looked good. I think my PA was off on a little angle because the tooth root was hidden behind the tooth next to it. The patient came back a couple weeks later because they needed another tooth out. In the meanwhile, they had seen an endodontist. The endodontist got a 3D x-ray and then sent me a message saying, hey, there's a little retained root tip. It wasn't causing any issues. I ended up taking it out anyway because I was in there bone grafting. Um, but I got that root tip out surgically actually had to expose it and actually go at it from the apex like an apicoectomy it was so fused to the bone so i got that tooth root out that way and the other molar so, so some teeth are just pain if it's a retained root and another way to access it is go at it from the actual apex you've seen that in textbooks i'm sure great we got a few questions asking what surgical burrs you prefer to use for sectioning teeth I am a big advocate of a 703 burr. I get my burrs from Comet because they are not only end cutting, but side cutting because it's a burr. Uh, but the end cutting is good because you can actually start putting, you can punch holes into teeth pretty easily and then start going side to side. Um, so a 703 carbide, 701 is also uh, my go-to for maybe a more delicate situation in anterior tooth or I'm trying to preserve bone. The 701 is a little bit skinnier. So that's what I use. And my hand piece, I meant to take a picture today, is a Bean Air, B I E N. A-I-R-E, it's a bean air handpiece, and they have different types of motors for those, uh, but that's what I use. High torque, it's electric, self-irrigating, it does the trick. It's a straight, or you can get a straight with a contra-angle handpiece part. Great, and then we'll do one more. There was a question about what do you use for photos? Intraoral camera, camera on phone. Maybe I'm wondering if they were referring to the iCap that you were showing. Um, were they referring? So if you're talking about the photos I use right here, any of these pictures, don't hate me iPhone users, but this is all on a Samsung Galaxy S10. Pretty much anything you see on my stories with my Samsung Galaxy. I will pull out my Canon, uh, 80D, I think every once in a while. Um, and then my my 3D images, if I can get to them, are just taken with uh, a screenshot from my, from my desktop. All right. Well, that will wrap it up for us this evening. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your presentation. If anyone has additional questions that we were unable to answer, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. In addition, I highly recommend giving Dr. Johnson a follow on Instagram. As a reminder, everyone attending tonight will receive a link to view the recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thank you all for attending and have a great evening.